All right. So let's start off today, quick review from last time, because last time we basically went through the entirety of the elbow, and I had intended to show you how to find uh, the muscles that we covered on the anatomy app. Um, that way, whenever you see them again on a quiz or on a test, you'll at least know how to find them. Um, so from the stuff that we covered last time, um, what is an action of biceps brachii? Anybody remember? Okay, flexion, good. At what joint? And there's two possibilities. Yep, so glenohumeral is one, the shoulder, all right. And then at what other joint is it a flexor? Humeral ulnar, good. So remember the humeral ulnar joint is the primary hinge joint of the elbow, so biceps is a flexor there. What are two other agonists for flexion at the humeral ulnar joint other than biceps brachii? Good, brachioradialis. Brachialis is the other one, good. Um, good, so there are three primary elbow flexors. Again, your elbow, the hinge joint, is the humeral ulnar joint. So the three primary flexors there, biceps brachii, brachialis, and brachioradialis. All right, what are my two extensors at the humeral ulnar joint? Triceps, Triceps brachii, good. And the one you had never heard of prior to our meeting on Monday. <laughs> if you had, good for you, but I would be surprised. The other one's Anconius. So Anconius is your other, uh, your accessory elbow extensor. All right, and then we talked about pronation supination. So at what joints does pronation supination occur? Anybody remember? Jack's doing it, you remember the joints? Nope, all right, it's okay. So the joints are, uh, so remember there's two of them, there's the proximal and distal, the radial ulnar joints. So pronation supination is caused by or affected by the radius spinning around the ulna. So the proximal and distal radial ulnar joints. So we have two muscles that are primary supinators. What are those two muscles? Carissa, you remember either of them? Good, biceps brachii, strongest one. Okay, yep, that one too. He does both pronation and supination. Uh, what's another muscle that's a supinator? Supinator, good. Don't overthink that question. Yep, so supinator does that. So our uh, primary agonists then for supination, biceps brachii, supinator, and then brachioradialis can also assist. All right, what about pronation? What are our two primary pronators other than brachioradialis? Good, pronator teres, and? Very good, pronator quadratus. Excellent. All right, um, so let me show you how to find all those real quick, and then we'll move on to the carpal bones. So, Biceps brachii, pretty obvious, that one right there. And so again, it'll only let me pick um, either the long head or the short head. In that case, we're on the long head. And so if we hide biceps, or I mentioned this last time, if you look at the lateral aspect of the arm, so deep to biceps or lateral to biceps is brachialis. So brachialis is here. So I'm actually just gonna hide biceps for now. And so then our brachialis is right there. So again, deep to biceps. Remember that brachialis inserts on the ulna, so it's a powerful elbow flexor regardless of forearm position. Pronation, supination don't matter for brachialis. So then we're going to get rid of that guy because we already talked about him. And then next one's brachioradialis, which is this one. So remember brachioradialis is another elbow flexor, also pronator, supinator, and in terms of elbow flexion, its primary position is when the thumb is up or in that kind of neutral forearm position. Hide that one. And then let's do our elbow extensor. So obviously triceps, bring him down a little bit. So there's triceps, I clicked on the long head, but we'll make the whole thing go away because we talked about triceps before. So then the one you hadn't seen before is Anconius. And Anconius is this little guy. So again, pretty small little muscle. You can imagine it doesn't really have much of an effect on elbow extension, but that's it. And then the ones we hadn't talked about yet So this is your bicepital aponeurosis. It's a sheet of connective tissue that we're gonna hide. So pronator teres is this one. So pronator teres is one of the ones I mentioned last time that helps stabilize the medial aspect of the elbow during a throwing motion. So if the forearm is in pronation, your elbow is a little more stable because pronator teres is contracted and shortened and helps reinforce the ulnar collateral ligament of the humeral ulnar joint. So that's pronator teres. And then we're actually gonna hide this 
uh, wrist extensor muscle here. We'll come back to him later. And then there's your supinator. So it takes a little bit to get to supinator. And supinator's on the plastic arms, as you'll see in the lab tomorrow as well. Um, but you gotta go through a few layers of, of muscle to get there. So that's where supinator is. And then pronator quadratus is way down here. And you can kind of see it underneath some of those long finger flexor muscles, but that's where pronator quadratus is. So that's how you find all of those. All right, so now let's take off all the muscle and let's talk some more bones. So now we're moving ahead on the slideshow to our carpal bones. All right, so we're gonna focus here on his right wrist as always. We're gonna stick to the right side of the body. So now you're looking then at an anterior view of the right wrist. So um, the wrist is, the technical name for your wrist joint is called the radial carpal joint. We'll get into why that is here in a second. But the carpal bones, you have eight little bones that make up your wrist. And so what we're gonna do, they're effectively grouped into two rows of four. There's a proximal row, so close to the body, and a distal row, so far from the body. We're gonna start proximal row thumb side, and I'm always gonna discuss them in that order for you. So our first carpal bone then, so again, proximal row, so here's, here's the row. So here's your proximal row, there's one, two, three, and then the fourth one actually sits on top of the third one, um, or more on the palmer aspect of the hand anterior two, and then our second row, here's one, two, three, and then four is there. So first row, proximal row, thumb side, our first bone is the scaphoid, which will highlight for me there. So there's your scaphoid. So fun things to know about the scaphoid. Um, so of your carpal bones, it is the most commonly fractured. So if you're gonna break one of the little bones in your wrist, it's almost always the scaphoid. I think it accounts for almost three quarters of wrist fractures. Um, and so the reason for that is, is if you fall, let's say you, you know, as it gets colder, you slip and fall on the ice. When you do that, when you catch yourself, typically you extend your shoulder, you extend your elbow, and then you extend your wrist, right? And so that means to bring the back side of your wrist toward the back part of your, of your forearm. And so then you catch yourself like that. Well, when you catch yourself on an extended wrist and all of your body weight falls on top of that, the scaphoid bone gets pinched between the distal aspect of the radius here and then this distal row of carpal bones. And so when it gets pinched in there, it tends to get crushed kind of in this midpoint right here. So the scaphoid, if you, when you see the plastic model of it, um, the name comes from the Greek word for boat, which is scaphaeides, because it kind of looks like a boat, sort of a, a C shape to it, or a bean if you want to look at it that way. Um, so it typically breaks right in the middle of the boat um, one of the unfortunate things about scaphoid fractures is that because of where it breaks, um, they tend to, to, it tends to not grow back together very easily. And the reason for that is because the primary artery that supplies the scaphoid comes in here distally. And so if you get a fracture proximally, well then that fracture isn't, isn't getting a lot of good blood flow and so it doesn't, it doesn't heal very well. So oftentimes scaphoid fractures require relatively long immobilization periods, potentially as long as three months. And if you're familiar with normal fracture healing times, four to six weeks, we're talking three months here, that's a long time to have your, your wrist in a cast. So oftentimes what they'll do is actually just put a screw in it. It's obviously a fairly short screw, but it'll screw those two together and sort of form a bridge to allow the new bone growth. And so that kind of speeds up the process. Um, one of the things about scaphoid fractures is they're pretty easily missed because oftentimes, so if somebody falls and you know, lands on an outstretched hand, we'll tend to assume that they have a wrist sprain because that's pretty common in most sports. You know, outfielder runs into a fence or one of your athletes falls and catches themselves. Now they got anterior and kind of lateral wrist pain. And you probably sprained your wrist, certainly possible. One of the key differentiators though with the scaphoid is that um, they have pain in what's called the anatomical snuff box. What the anatomical snuff box is, if you extend your thumb, so do a thumbs up as hard as you can and kind of extend your wrist a little bit, you'll notice two really obvious thumb extensor tendons right there. And your scaphoid, sits right in between them. So it's called the anatomical snuff box. Uh, the, the term was coined in the medical literature in the mid 1850s um, because people used to take dry tobacco ground up, so snuff, and snort it out of that little box there. And so that's why it's called the snuff box. So it started showing up uh, using that terminology in anatomy text in the early 1900s. So scaphoid sits in there. So what matters to you is if you've got an athlete that falls on an outstretched hand, you think maybe they have a sprained wrist, but they have pain in the snuff box, you need to send them for x-rays because we don't want to miss those fractures. So that's your scaphoid. Next to the scaphoid, so now we're moving medially because we're moving toward the pinky side of the hand. The next one is the lunate. 
And so the lunate is so named because of its shape. It viewed a certain way kind of looks like a crescent moon. It has a very obvious concave surface to it. And that concave surface on the lunate acts uh, or interacts with the scaphoid, but also with this bone right here, which we'll get to in a minute, but that bone's called the capitate. So if I isolate the lunate, I'll show you that surface that gives it its name. So we're gonna spin it maybe this way a little bit. So now you're seeing the side of the bone that would interact with the scaphoid. And so that really obvious concave surface there Again, looks like a moon or half moon, and so that's why it's called the lunate. So the lunate is the most um, commonly dislocated of the carpal bones, second most commonly fractured. It gets caught in the same way the scaphoid does, gets pinched between the second row of carpal bones and the radius, and so it can become fractured. The other thing about the lunate is it doesn't really have good ligament connections to the bones around it, and especially not to this big bone called the capitate, and the capitate is kind of the anchor for the carpal bones, and so because of that, lunate moves around quite a bit. So typically what happens with the lunate is somebody falls on an outstretched hand, lunate will pop anteriorly. You won't see it or anything because of the, of the uh, finger flexor tendons, but basically the wrist is gonna get stuck in extension like this. And so then you have to kind of put some traction on it and you'll be able to move it back into place. And they'll report some other symptoms that I won't tell you about yet because uh, they're part of a case study. So uh, that's lunate dislocation. So next to lunate, we have the three cornered bone. So the next one is the trochetrum. So the trochetrum is right here. So the trochetrum, in looking at the bone, when you see the ones like the skeletons in lab, the three corners are not obvious, but apparently some uh, anatomists thought that it had three corners, so that's what it's called. Uh, trochetrum, third most commonly fractured of the bones. Um, it plays a role in the radiocarpal or the wrist joint. The three bones that really play a role in the wrist joint are the, the scaphoid, the lunate, and the trochetrum. But the trochetrum only really plays a role if you're in what's called ulnar deviation, which means to take the pinky side of your hand and bring it to, toward your ulna. So it would look like adduction. That's typically what we call a motion like that, but it's actually called ulnar deviation in the wrist. So then the trochetrum plays a role, has some contact with um, a, a little cartilage disc there that we'll talk about in a second, but then also the radius. And then sitting on top of trochetrum or on the anterior aspect of it is the pisiform. And the pisiform is called that because it's shaped like a pea. And so the pisiform is a, a fun bone um, in that it's what's called a sesamoid bone. And a sesamoid bone is a bone that sits inside of a tendon. So the sesamoid bone that you're most familiar with is your patella, which is the name for your kneecap, right? Because that sits in your quad tendon. But in this case, the uh, pisiform bone sits in the tendon of a muscle called flexor carpi ulnaris. So FCU is the abbreviation for that one. So flexor carpi ulnaris, it sits in that tendon. Um, and so pisiform actually has a decent amount of mobility to it. So how you find your pisiform, because this is the fun part. So if you look at the, the pinky side of your hand, so that mo most medial aspect and proximal aspect of your hand, there's a pretty obvious kind of a, a 90 degree angle there. And there's a hard surface, okay? So I'm poking at my pisiform right now. So what I want you to do is to try to put your index finger on one side, your thumb on the other side of that bone, relax your wrist a little bit, and then you can shift it left and right. Because again, it sits inside of a tendon, so it's actually a pretty mobile little bone, and so you can move it around. Yeah, so you didn't know you could do that. So that's your pisiform bone. So that's that one. Um, significance of that, the transverse carpal ligament uh, inserts there. So that's a ligament that helps uh, protect the anterior aspect of the wrist, and we'll talk about it quite, quite a bit more here in a minute. So the transverse carpal ligament inserts there. All right, so that's my proximal row. So scaphoid, lunate, trochetrum, pisiform. Now we're gonna go to the distal row and we're gonna start back on the thumb side. So our first one there on the thumb side is the trapezium. There it is. So the trapezium is a really important little bone because of the shape of its articular surface with the thumb here. So the trapezium's distal surface is shaped like a saddle. Remember we talked about saddle joints when we talked about the sternoclavicular joint. So in the case of a saddle joint, you've got one aspect of the surface that's concave, and then, so let's say medial to lateral is concave, and then anterior to posterior is convex. The reason that that matters is because that allows that joint then to move in two planes. So the saddle shape of the trapezium is really important. That gives us more range of motion in the thumb, or more specifically, it gives us an additional degree of freedom in the thumb. And so it's an important little shape there. Then we got the trapezoid, named for its shape. 
So the trapezoid interacts with the second metacarpal, which is the long bone of the hand of your index finger. Nothing really exciting happens to the trapezoid. You don't break it very often. It doesn't dislocate. So it's not a super exciting bone. But the thing to know about it, I suppose, is that it interacts with that second uh, finger. Then we got the capitate. So the capitate uh, is called that because it has a big head. So it's the largest of the carpal bones. And the, the proximal aspect of it, is it has this really round dome. Um, and so capitis, anything capitis is your head. Um, so like tinea capitis is a fungal infection on your head. Uh, so anything capitis <laughs> is a head. So uh, capitate then is a big head. Uh, as mentioned earlier, it's the largest of the carpal bones. It, it has, um, it sort of forms a keystone to the carpal bones, helps secure the rest of them, has a lot of ligamentous connections to the remainder of the carpal bones. So it gives some stability to that, to the rows of carpal bones. And then our last one there is our handmate. So the handmate articulates with the fourth and the fifth fingers, the fifth being your pinky. Um, so your ring finger and your pinky. So the handmate, another important thing about it, um, so it has a structure called the hook, which the hook you can see, if I turn him a little bit, rotate. So you can see how it forms a little hook right there. That's the hook of the handmate. Another, again, another easily palpable uh, structure on your own wrist. So if you remember where your pisiform was, if you come, uh, m move a little bit toward the thumb side of your hand, so work a little bit laterally. So you should feel a little bit of a drop. And then you'll feel another little bump right there. So mine is right there, is the hook of my handmate. So uh, the hook of the handmate, things about it, um, commonly fractured or relatively commonly fractured in um, sports like baseball or in golf, where you've got an implement in your hand. And if you, you know, sometimes, especially if you ever use a metal bat and you hit something wrong and the bat vibrates in your hand, sometimes that can cause a fracture of the hook of the handmate. You can break it falling on outstretched hand. Golfers do it sometimes if they're, you know, in the rough and they hit a rock or a tree root or something like that and get some good vibration. They can uh, fracture the hook of their handmate there as well. So that's why sometimes you'll see like baseball players wear pads there. If, you've, if you keep up with baseball bats, they have some that have like an axe handle shape to it rather than that knob to try to take some pressure off of that and avoid a fracture there. The other thing about that, so you got a, your ulnar nerve runs through there. So remember we talked about the ulnar nerve with the funny bone. So your ulnar nerve continues down the forearm, runs through there. That's called the tunnel of Guyon, G-O-G-U-Y-O-N, guy on. It's a French doctor. Um, so the ulnar nerve sits in there. Sometimes cyclists have problems where they'll get like numbness in their fourth and fifth fingers from like sitting on their handlebars for too long. And so basically they just mash their ulnar nerve for a long period of time in that tunnel. All right, so those are your carpal bones. So proximal row again, scaphoid, lunate, trichetrum, pisiform, distal row, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. So a couple things that are, or to know, I guess the first thing is the fact that there are three T's I found really difficult the first time that I learned this. So I always go trichetrum, trapezium, the ums go together in terms of the ordering of them, and then trapezoid is just the other one. So trichetrum, trapezium go together, trapezoid left out. The other thing is um, there's a mnemonic for all of those bones. So if you want to do the mnemonic, it's semi risque, but not very, not too bad. Um, so remember, here's your first row, SLTP, okay, scaphoid linear trichetrum pisiform. And then here's your second row. So trichetrum, or I mean, trichetrum, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, hamate. So the, the mnemonic for that is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. I don't know if that helps you or not, but um, that's how I learned it a long time ago. Um, and it's a pretty common mnemonic that they talk about in anatomy classes. So some lovers try positions that they can't handle. All right, so there's our carpal bones. And then, go back to my slideshow. Remember what I'm supposed to talk about next. Okay. Oh, yeah, case study. All right. So we're going to pretend that you're working at a physical therapy clinic, and you've got a patient, a woman in her, let's say, late 40s, early 50s, comes into you complaining of hand pain. That's all I'll give you for now. What kind of questions would you want to ask her? That's a great question. So she actually works at a chicken processing plant. 
And so her job is that she has to take different, sh different size knives all day and do chicken processing. They, they move station to station. Um, so she does a little bit different cutting all day, but she does some pretty fine work with knives and does that for eight, eight hour shifts or longer. Great question. So this is occupationally related. Oftentimes hand issues are. Good question. So uh, the pain is often that she gets kind of like a shooting or, or burning pain. Um, and I'll just give you where the pain is. Typically it's in her second and third fingers and to some extent kind of on this area between the first and second finger. So she has burning pain in her index finger and middle finger and then occasionally in, on the uh, more lateral or sorry, more, more medial aspect of her thumb. And the pain gets worse, like that she really brings that pain on when she extends her wrist. So in wrist extension that causes that tingling and so then that's painful. And similarly, if her wrist is in flexion for a long time, so if she's kind of flopped forward like this for a long period of time, her fingers go numb. She just can't feel them. Anything else you want to know? Good questions so far. Other things she's noticed, she's having a hard time gripping. So she's like, while she's cutting the chickens at work, sometimes the knife just falls out of her hand. Like her grip strength has really declined pretty significantly. Um, so both, especially her thumb strength, like she can't really, if you do what's called opposition, where you take your thumb and bring it to your other fingers, she can't really do that pinch grip very effectively. She's pretty weak in that. And then also in finger flexion, especially of uh, digits two and three. All right, so what might she have going on? Any guesses? Nope. She's got carpal tunnel syndrome, right? So it's a syndrome you've heard before. I just didn't give you the normal like secretarial typing kind of thing. Um, where I went to grad school uh, and where Dr. Kephart went to school as well, um, in East Texas, there's a bunch of chicken processing plants, a bunch of Tyson plants in that area, or at least there used to be. And so when we do our rotations at PT clinics, we'd oftentimes get hand injuries from people who are working at the processing plants. And so it wouldn't be uncommon for them to have carpal tunnel syndrome. Or there's another condition we're not gonna talk about but I'll just tell you about, um, where sometimes if you do a lot of gripping and like wrist flexion, you can get little nodules that build up on your uh, finger flexor tendons. And so those nodules get stuck underneath some connective tissue that runs perpendicular to them. It's called trigger finger. And so when you squeeze, that little knob will actually move underneath that connective tissue and then get stuck. And so their finger gets stuck like that. It's usually the fourth finger. And so then they can like take their other hand and like push that little knob back through that connective tissue and it'll pop it back open. <laughs> and so that's one of the ladies we saw for a while had been doing that for a long time. And she finally just couldn't do it anymore. Um, so anyway, but the, the case study I was giving you was a patient who has carpal tunnel syndrome. So I mentioned the transverse carpal ligament. So I actually mentioned twice where it inserts, but I didn't ever tell you where it originates. Um, so transverse carpal ligament, um, on the more medial as menial aspect, not menial, medial aspect of the hand, inserts into the pisiform and the hook of the handmate. But on the lateral aspect of the hand, it originates from the scaphoid and the trapezium. So it connects those four carpal bones basically. And so what the transverse carpal ligament is, connects bones to bones because it's a ligament. And so it's a ligament that runs medial to lateral across the hand or lateral to medial, however you want to look at it, um, that forms the roof of the carpal tunnel. So the carpal tunnel, the floor of that structure is those eight carpal bones we just talked about. And then the, the roof of the structure or the ceiling of the structure is the transverse carpal ligament. What sits in there? Well, what sits in there primarily are your long finger flexor tendons. And so what, what the transverse carpal ligament does is keeps those finger flexor tendons up against your wrist so they don't, what's called bowstring out. So whenever, if you didn't have a transverse carpal ligament, every time you flex your wrist, those flexor tendons would actually pull away from your wrist a little bit. So that'd be bad. So to avoid that, we have a ligament there to keep them nice and close. But in addition to those structures in the carpal tunnel, and so here's another picture of it, so here's, so now you're looking down at the wrist, so you can see all the little carpal bones here. There's the transverse carpal ligament. So here's all your little finger flexor tendons, and then you've also got the median nerve that sits in there. Well, the median nerve innervates your thumb, your index finger, and your middle finger, as far as sensation goes. And so what ends up happening is with a lot of gripping or fine finger motion, you can inflame those tendons, those finger flexor tendons, inside of the tunnel. Well, as you know, when any structure becomes inflamed, it tends to swell. And so when those finger flexor tendons swell, they're gonna try to push out, they'll try to push down on the bones, but they're not gonna get anywhere pushing on bones. 
they'll try to push up against this transverse carpal ligament, but of course you're not going to get anywhere there either. So then all they really end up doing is actually pressing on the softest structures in the tunnel, which happens to be the median nerve. So then they compress the nerve, and then that causes it to uh, misfire, if you will. So it causes it to depolarize when it shouldn't, and so then that causes tingling and numbness. The other thing is um, the lack of motor signals to the muscles, especially the thumb, this area, the, the kind of fattest part of your hand by your thumb there is called the thenar eminence. So the, the muscles there are innervated by the median nerve. So if the median, median nerve isn't functioning correctly, those muscles can't, and so that's why she can't oppose. It also um, innervates some of the finger flexor tendons inside of the hand too, so you can't, uh, can't grip as well. So that's carpal tunnel syndrome and the carpal tunnel. All right, so the other bones of the hand. So then we got the metacarpals. So the metacarpals are the long bones of the hand. And so the way that they're numbered, they're numbered one through five. One is your thumb, and five is your pinky. So the first metacarpal then is the long bone of the hand that interacts with your thumb. So on all of us, it's kind of the least obvious. So your first metacarpal, where your thumb ends or originates, if you will. So your first metacarpal then is this long bone right there. And so oftentimes you can kind of pop at that joint, its interaction with that saddle joint. That's where you're causing it to pop. Anyway, so that's your first metacarpal. And then if, the rest of them are pretty easy to find. If you make a fist and look at the backside of your hand, those are your metacarpals, right? So there's my second that interacts with my uh, index finger, third with my middle finger, fourth with my ring finger, and then fifth there with my pinky. So those are the metacarpals of the hand. And then we have the phalanges. So the finger bones are your phalanges. Your thumb only has two. And then the other digits two through five have three phalanges. So singular is a phalanx. Plural are phalanges. So um, in terms of referring to specific bones, again, the thumb only has two. So the thumb has a proximal phalanx, because remember, proximal is close to the body, and then a distal phalanx, which is far from the body. And then, as mentioned, the other digit, so on digit two, proximal phalanx, middle or intermediate phalanx, and then distal phalanx there. Anybody know why they're called phalanges or singular phalanx? Because history's fun. So some ancient anatomists thought that they looked like a Greek fighting formation. So the way that the ancient Greeks fought was in a, a battle formation called a phalanx, which is basically a big rectangle. And so what you'd have is, the movie's reference is getting old now, but if you've ever seen the movie 300, where the guys are all fighting, and so what they've got are overlapping shields, right? And so you're, you're protecting the guy next to you, and the, other, the guy on your other side is protecting you, and then you take your long spears and just stab over the top. And so as the first row, if those guys get killed or injured, as those guys drop, the row behind them fills in. And so you have just kind of this big moving rectangle, and so the fighting formation would look like that, again, a big rectangle. And then if you looked at the entire Greek army, you'd have one rectangle behind another, behind another, and then um, beside each other as well. And so somebody, an ancient anatomist, looked at that hand and thought, oh, that looks kind of like the Greek army in the field. You've got all of those different phalanxes or phalanges, right? And so singular phalanx. So that's where the name comes from. They look like a Greek fighting formation. Yep, so yeah, thumb's only proximal distal. So it only has one interphalangeal joint. All right, so let's talk about the radiocarpal joint, abbreviated RC, but apparently not on my slide. So your radiocarpal joint is your wrist joint. So um, in terms of the bones that articulate at the radiocarpal joint, so primarily you've got the distal aspect of the radius. Remember we talked last time about how the distal aspect of the radius is wider or larger than it is proximally at the elbow. So the distal aspect of the radius pretty wide down here. And then you've got something else called the triangular fibrocartilage complex or TFCC for short. The TFCC um, is a disc of fibrocartilage. So remember fibrocartilage is, is a fairly dense cartilage that helps cushion impact between bones. So for example, we've talked about fibrocartilage before in the case of the glenoid labrum. That's another, another example of fibrocartilage. Um, and so the fibrocartilage in the wrist is where it says articular disc here. That's the fibrocartilage part of it. And then there are um, three ligaments that also play a role in that. And so you can see those there. You've got your ulnar collateral ligament, the ulnocarpal ligament, uh, 
yeah, ulnocarpal ligament, and then the disc, and then there's another ulnocarpal ligament on the other side. There's a, a dorsal one. So I don't want you to know about the ligaments, but I do want you to know that the TFCC includes a disc of fibrocartilage. And so its real job is to remember that at, at the ulna, there's a little gap here. And so one of the things, the primary thing that the, the fibrocartilage aspect of that structure does is to kind of close the gap between the trachetrum and the ulna. So it sort of acts as a space filler. Certainly it absorbs impact, but it also acts as a space filler. So the TFCC is something, um, you see athletes injure when they fall on outstretched hand. So for example, some, when you watch baseball, sometimes guys will um, carry their batting gloves, like whenever they slide so that they don't like reach out and fall on an outstretched hand. And the reason they're trying to do that is to avoid, in part, a TFCC injury. You also see athletes in the weight room sometimes. Um, a good friend of mine in grad school was doing push-ups with his feet in a TRX band, you know, the suspension bands. So his feet were in one of those and he was doing push-ups and basically he lost control and his feet kind of like slid out, you know, from under him. So his, his hands are on the floor and so then you get uh, compression and rotation in the wrist. And so he, he tore that fibrocartilage in his wrist doing that. So usually some kind of combination of uh, compression and rotation will tear it. Yep. Potentially, um, but it would have to be it has to be a lot of weight to tear a ligament because you, you you know those muscles those flexor muscles are, are contracting and helping reinforce the joint so that would be a pretty unusual injury and usually the guys that are you know like benching 500 pounds typically have like wrist wraps and stuff on there to kind of take some pressure off the ligaments but yeah good question um, so typically it's more of like a fall kind of an injury yep. So there's a couple different kinds. So the ones I'm talking about are the compressive ones where you like put a loop around your thumb and then wrap it around your hand. Okay. Um, Cause there are also like the grippy wrist straps where you wrap it around and like hold onto a bar better. Um, yeah, so it's basically to um, take some pressure off those anterior ligaments, but then also to kind of put a little bit of a traction on the joint. Cause otherwise you're just getting so much compression. Um, so it puts a little traction on there, takes some pressure off the scaphoid. So yeah, that's why people use them. Cause, and actually really, it's just cause it's generally uncomfortable. Like if you do a lot of like cleans and stuff and your wrist is really hyperextended, like after you're done, it just hurts. And so the, the taking the pressure off helps with that. So then the distal aspect of the radiocarpal joint then, three bones, scaphoid, lunate, and trachetrum. But again, primarily scaphoid and lunate. So your radiocarpal joint then in terms of primary structures, distal aspect of the radius, scaphoid and lunate. And then the midcarpal joint, um, so the mid-carpal joint is essentially the, or it is, the interaction between the proximal row here and the distal row here. So the mid-carpal joint's a non-axial joint. You just get a little bit of sliding between the two rows of bones. And where that becomes important, whenever you flex or extend at the radiocarpal joint, at the wrist joint, so you get um, some rolling and sliding of the scaphoid and the lunate on the radius. But to give you a little bit more motion, you also get a, a somewhat of a slide at the mid-carpal joint, so between the distal row and the proximal row as well. All those. All right. So things that we can do at the radiocarpal joint. So you can flex. So bringing the, the palmar or anterior aspect of your hand closer to your forearm is wrist flexion or radiocarpal flexion. Bringing the dorsal or posterior aspect of your hand closer to the posterior aspect of your forearm is wrist extension. Again, usually how you catch yourself if you're going to fall is wrist extension. And then the two that can be confusing um, are ulnar and radial deviation because they should be called adduction and abduction, but they're not. So that makes life a little difficult. So ulnar deviation then is when you, from anatomical position, take the pinky side of your hand, bring it closer to the ulna. So again, looks like adduction, just has a special name. And then abduction, take the thumb side of your hand, or sorry, radial deviation that should be abduction. Take the thumb side of your hand, bring it out closer to the lateral aspect of your forearm. So one of the things you probably noticed there, how come I can't go very far into radial deviation, but I can go really far into ulnar deviation? And the answer is the ulna doesn't extend as far at the wrist. There's that gap there. Again, the TFCC fills in part of that gap, but because there's that space, you have extra motion there into ulnar deviation. And we see a similar kind of thing in the ankle. You can really roll your ankle um, where you, it's called inversion, where you take the bottom of your foot and roll it toward the midline, but you can't go very far the other way. And the reason for that's the arrangement of the tibia and the fibula. The fibula goes down a lot farther. And so you don't, you don't have as much range of motion uh, laterally. So same idea. All right, so 
movements in the metacarpophalangeal joints of digits two through five. So now we're talking about all the fingers that aren't the thumb. The metacarpophalangeal joints are the interaction of the metacarpals, the long bones of the hand, and the proximal phalanx of digits two through five. So when you make a fist, your knuckles, those are your MCP joints. So the things that we can do there are flexion extension. So you can bend your fingers there. You can extend them, which is just straightening them out. So flexion looks like that, and the extension's there. And then also that joint, you can abduct, so you can spread your fingers, and then you can adduct. So at the second metacarbophalangeal joint, that's where you taunt someone after you get a big uh, block in basketball, right? So you can AB adduct, and so that's that no motion. And so the reason for that um, owes to the concave convex arrangement. It's called a condyloid joint. Um, basically, the, the distal aspect of your metacarpals kind of looks like the top of an egg. And then you have a concave surface that sits on top of that, so it allows anterior posterior motion, but also medial lateral motion because of the shape of the joint. So there's your flexion extension. All right, the next set of joints. So you have, uh, in digits two through five, you have distal interphalangeal joints and proximal interphalangeal joints. So interphalangeal means between phalanges, right? Because inter is between, phalangeal, the phalanges. So the distal interphalangeal joint then is the joint between your distal phalanx and middle phalanx. So it's your farthest knuckle. So way out there, close to your nail. That's your DIP joint. And then the one joint closer is the PIP joint. So the proximal interphalangeal joint. The interaction of the middle phalanx and proximal phalanx. That's your PIP. So dips and pips, those are hinge joints. All you can do there is flexion extension, assuming your finger is shaped normally and not injured. You can only get flexion extension there. Yep. Yep, so yeah, for both DIP and PIP of all digits two through five, Flexion extension only. Yep. So then for your thumb, would you just have one You do, yep. So there's only the IP joint of the thumb. And all you get there is flexion extension as well, because that would be this one. So I can do is flex and extend. And so there's pictures of those, what some of those look like with thumb motion. All right, so let's talk about the thumb. So the thumb, as mentioned, has a special carpometacarpal joint. So again, that's the, the interaction between the trapezium and the first metacarpal. Both of those surfaces have a saddle shape to them. So between the trapezium here, the distal aspect, aspect of it, and then the proximal aspect of the first metacarpal, that those saddle on top of saddle allow for two plane motion or two degrees of freedom. So at the carpometacarpal joint of the thumb, you can do four things or two degrees of freedom. You can do uh, flexion and extension. So the easiest one to, to see is thumb extension. So that's just doing a thumbs up is thumb extension. And then going the other way is thumb flexion. The weird one is thumb abduction. So thumb abduction, what that is, if you're standing in an anatomical position, bring your thumb straight forward. That's thumb abduction. Seems like it'd be flexion, but it's not. It's abduction. And then bring your thumb back to your hand, that's adduction. And so since I can do ABA deduction, I can also then do opposition, so I can touch my thumb to my other fingers. All right, and there's my saddle shape. And there's a close-up of the first met carpal metacarpal joint. And then there's another close-up, different view, lateral view. All right, and so as mentioned a second ago, at the IP joint of the thumb, there's only one, because you only have two phalanges in the thumb, so all you can do there is flexion extension. So that one's pretty straightforward. In terms of where that is, so the IP joint of the thumb is there. So one thing on the, the plastic hands, and it, just if I give you a picture of a hand like this or from the anatomy app, don't forget about the metacarpals. Because oftentimes people talk about like IP joints being here, but that's an MCP joint. And usually where people get confused is in the thumb. So the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb is right here, but oftentimes people pick that as the IP joint. So just make sure you, you, you know, ration out or re, uh, reason out which bones are interacting there, metacarpophalangeal or two phalanges, it's an interphalangeal. And then there's a picture as an FYI of all the thumb motions. 
All right, another case study. So um, we're going to pretend, make you an athletic trainer again, and you have a football offensive lineman that comes to you complaining of thumb pain. He's had thumb pain going on for about a week, um, and in the mechanism of injury, just to speed things up a little bit, uh, is in, in last week's game, he was trying to make a block like this guy is, and so his thumb was, was out, it was abducted a little bit, and he caught underneath the guy's shoulder pads, and it forced his thumb into abduction. And so now he's got pretty significant pain there, and so one of the things he tells you is that um, every time he tries to grip, he's really weak. So like twisting off bottle caps or trying to tear open bags of things, he can't do it. He can't really, his pinch grip has declined pretty significantly, which is problematic. In addition to that, his thumb just hurts. So you notice he has some bruising around the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb and also some swelling there. So given that mechanism of injury where his thumb got forced into abduction and now he can't grip, what do you think he might have done? Okay, that's a really good guess, scaphoid fracture. Not that, but that's a great guess. He did tear a ligament, good. So the particular ligament that he tore is called the ulnar collateral ligament. Sounds familiar, but it's a different joint, bless you. So it is the ulnar collateral ligament of the metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb. So any of your hinge joints, whether it's a metacarpophalangeal joint of the thumb, or the IP joints, or the humeral ulnar joint, all of your hinge joints have what are called collateral ligaments. There's one ligament on the inside, or medial aspect, one ligament on the outside, and so those protect against valgus and varus forces, which we talked about last time. Remember, valgus force is from the outside in, so lateral to medial, varus force, medial to lateral. And so he got valgus force there, and so he tore his UCL of his thumb. The fun, interesting thing about that, it's called gamekeeper's thumb, is the more colloquial name for it, um, because when an injury to the UCL of the MCP joint of the thumb was first described in the medical literature in the 1950s, the doctor um, was describing Scottish gamekeepers. The, the game that these farmers kept was rabbits. And so what they would do to kill their rabbits before they sold them or whatever, is basically they would pin the rabbit head against the ground. Sorry, it's kind of gory. They'd pin the rabbit head against the ground and hyperextend its neck with their thumb. And so in doing that repetitively, they would get uh, injuries of the UCL of the thumb. And so then every time you push your thumb back, you get pretty significant pain. So you see that, um, I think I have another picture there. So that's what that looks like in terms of the test for it. So the test for it is pretty straightforward. You push their finger back again, and they say, oh, that hurts. Oh, okay. Does that hurt right there? Yeah, okay. Well, that's what you did. Um, so usually um, you see, like, sometimes baseball catchers have, like, a little protective thing to kind of keep their thumb in. And you'll see football uh, offensive linemen oftentimes will have, like, a, a wrap where their thumb is pulled close to the hand. That's either because they previously injured that or they're trying to avoid that injury. So if we can avoid hyper abducting the thumb, then you can avoid gamekeeper's thumb. It's also called skier's thumb because sometimes um, downhill skiers will get their pole stuck in the ground and it'll force their thumb to abduction as well. I just think gamekeepers is more interesting. So there's your collateral ligaments. Um, there's one there. And then the volar plate, just as an FYI. So on all those hinge joints, um, and actually, technically speaking, the MCP, MCPs of two through five are not hinge joints, those are condyloids. But um, on all of those uh, joints of the fingers, on the palmar aspect of them, you have what's called a volar plate, which is a little fibrocartilage plate that sits between the flexor tendon and the joint capsule that helps reinforce that joint. And so sometimes if you like really hyperextend your fingers, you can also get volar plate damage. All right, so let's talk about some muscles to shift gears a little bit. So this first group of muscles, so now we're into the wrist muscles or the radiocarbal muscles. So this first group all originates on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. So remember last time, one of the things I said was that the uh, medial epicondyle, the group of muscles that originates there are your wrist flexor pronator group. On the lateral epicondyle, which is what we're starting with, you've got the wrist extensor supinator group. So our first muscle is extensor carpi radialis longus. And it's called longus, because there's a brevis. This one's called longus because its origin is a little bit more proximal than the brevis. So you can see the origin there on that uh, supracondylar ridge on the lateral aspect of the humerus. So it originates a little higher up than the brevis does. So it has a longer belly. It's going to insert on the base of the second metacarpal. It says on the dorsal base, so that just means on the back side of the hand. Because these are all wrist extensors, so they have to insert somewhere on the backside or posterior aspect of the hand, which is called the dorsum of the hand. 
So inserts on the dorsal base of the second metacarpal. And so you can see the things that it does. So it's a weak flexor at the elbow. So weak flexion, humeral ulnar joint. So it's an accessory flexor there. But its primary job is extension at the wrist. So extension radiocarpal. And because of its orientation between its origin and its insertion, it is also a radial deviator. So it does three different things. Weak flexor at the humeral ulnar joint, primary extensor, radiocarpal, which is your wrist, and then also a radial deviator, radiocarpal, which is your wrist. All right. And then the next one is its close friend, brother, whatever you want to call it, extensor carpi radialis brevis. So again, all the origins for these are going to be basically the same. They're all going to arise from the lateral epicondyle. And then extensor carpi radialis brevis, we shift it over a little bit toward the pinky side of the hand. So it's going to insert at the base of the third metacarpal. And so you can see it's also an ex uh, sorry, a flexor of the elbow, so humeral ulnar, an extensor radiocarpal. And then this, the anatomy app lists it as a radial deviator. Most of the, like, I, our, I don't think our textbook does. I think the textbook calls it a straight uh, extensor. But since the anatomy app calls it a radial deviator, we'll call it a radial deviator. So radial deviation, radial carpal is its last action. So you can find these two, and I'll, work into the next one while I'm talking about these two. So on yourself, if you want to find those two, because they're all superficial muscles, the first one defines brachioradialis. It's kind of your orienting muscle on the, on the posterior aspect of your forearm. So if you flex your elbow to 90 degrees, push your arm down, and hold it there, that first muscle that pops up is your brachioradialis. So if you move toward the pinky side of your hand just a little bit, keep your fingers there, and if you extend your wrist and radial deviate, you'll feel those muscle bellies pop up underneath your fingers. Right? And so that's your extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. You can't tell the difference between the two of them, just palpating like that. But if you do slide a little bit closer to your pinky, if you fan your fingers and you can see it move, that's your extensor digitorum, which is the next muscle we're going to talk about. All right. So extensor digitorum. You know what? We are almost out of time, and I have a bunch about extensor digitorum, so we'll come back to it on Friday. So pick up on Friday with extensor digitorum because there's some interesting stuff about its uh, insertion, its dorsal expansion, and that kind of stuff. So we'll leave off there. We'll pick up on Friday, and I'll show you how to find all that stuff. Uh, in the lab tomorrow, we'll look at the uh, bones and bony landmarks of the elbow, wrist, and hand. And then I'll also have the plastic arms out if you want to start trying to find the muscles on the plastic arms as well. So if you can make it tomorrow, awesome. And if I don't see you again until Friday, well, that's okay too. So have a good day. We'll see you, see you in a few days.